Let's kick off episode 625 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear with the song Black Blades in the Shallows. It's from the band The Rum Tones. They are a surf band based out of Savannah, Georgia, and you can find them at therumtones.bandcamp.com and check out their entire album, which is called The Rum Tones, when you're done listening to this episode of Monster Kid Radio. My name is Derek M. Cook, your writer, producer, and host and guide through this week's episode and pretty much every other episode too except for the few times when somebody else fills in for me but anyway what we're talking about this week is uh well we got some catch-up to do i've got some feedback that's been building up that i want to dive into plus we have some random voicemails that came from monster bash so we got some monster bash recap and chris mcmillan from the shadow over portland also was at monster bash in person monster bash is at big convention that happens well now twice a year out in Pennsylvania celebrating classic monster movies. We've gone in the past. We've been there. Unfortunately, we haven't. Monster Kid Radio hasn't been there in a couple of years. You know, COVID happened, then finances and just scheduling and everything else. But we are looking at 2024 as a return of Monster Kid Radio to Monster Bash. Fingers and tentacles crossed that we can make everything happen. There's a lot of moving parts, some podcast related, some not, that need to kind of fall in line for us to go but we're hoping to go but in the meantime we have awesome content that was sent in from people who went to the monster bash like i said chris mcmillan was there and he did an interview with audrey dalton and uh, we're going to kick things off with that but first we have mark's beta capsule review he is continuing our journey through the ultraman franchise and he's been knocking that out of the park man he he does not take a break plus He's going to be on an upcoming episode of MKR in the near future, and we'll talk about that at the end of the show. But to get to the end of the show, we got to get through all the feedback, we got to get through the interview, we got to get through all the segments. Why don't we do the Beta Capsule Review right now? Hold on to your blood, because your blood is their life, because your nightmare is their reality. They are history's deadliest vampires, creating the panic only one man can stop. Captain Cronus, Vampire Hunter, with death at every doorway, trembling in every heart. Now, the terror must be challenged. Who lives to destroy the curse? Kill me! Who duels to battle the undead? Her youth will pulse through your veins, my darling. Who dares to bleed the bloodthirsty? Yes, you bleed, my lord. At last, horror has met its match. Captain Cronus, Vampire Hunter, from Paramount Pictures, rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. Frankenstein's monster can be destroyed by fire. Dracula, by a silver stake driven through his heart. But nothing, nothing will avail against the absolute evil of the creeping flesh. A scientific experiment turns into a nightmare as a creature from hell, buried since the dawn of time, is restored to life. The creeping flesh will infect the innocent with its malignant power. The creeping flesh will drive the insane to new excesses of madness and murder. The creeping flesh from Columbia Pictures, rated PG, parental guidance suggested. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Return of Ultraman, Episode 19, 
The Invisible Giant Monster from Outer Space. Original air date, August 13th, 1971. While caring for his pets, Jiro and friends witness a meteorite striking the ground near their apartment, and they immediately call on Monster Attack Team because, Jiro says, Go is like a big brother to him. MAT allows the kids to keep the object, which turns out to be a bad idea, as it grows to the point of producing a monster. Hit by debris, Jiro is hospitalized, where he implores Go to beat the kaiju, but strangely his friends deny seeing anything unusual. Hypothesizing that they might be dealing with a transparent monster, MAT investigates the mysterious destruction of a car, which leads them into combat with an invisible assailant. Using a special camera, they get their first sight of a creature with an impossibly long trunk, which destroys buildings with ease. Oka pilots an MAT arrow, but after multiple bombing runs against the monster, must eject when Sartan destroys the plane. Meanwhile, Jiro's condition continues to decline as he loses hope in Go and Monster Attack Team. After an emotional, intense conversation with Ken Sakata, Go resolves to defeat Sartan or die trying. But how can he conquer an opponent he can't see? The invisible giant monster from outer space effectively strengthens the ties between Go and the Sakata family, revealing how much Jiro looks up to Go and how Go allows Ken to speak to him with an almost fatherly authority. Monster Sartan is a formidable opponent, another in the line of space kaiju, but unfortunately his distended trunk makes it hard to take him as seriously as the story might need. Nevertheless, Jiro's faith in Go is restored, and viewers are treated to the first use of the Ultra Bracelet that had been given by Ultra 7 in the previous episode. Jiro Sakata was played by Hideki Kawaguchi, who would have been around 10 years old during Return of Ultraman. He would appear in a standalone episode of Ultraman Ace the following year, before going on to be a series regular in 1973's Kamen Rider V3, before getting out of acting altogether in the late 70s. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Mansky reporting. Filmed in the woods of Northern California. Bigfoot. Filmed in Bosburg, Washington. Bigfoot. Filmed in a beaver swamp. Authentic motion picture footage. Never before seen. Now, in the legend of Bigfoot. A world famous scientist, greatest living master of the occult, has mysteriously vanished. In his place, a huge and fearsome prehistoric monster suddenly appears. What happened to Dr. Waterman? Only one man, last to see him alive, knows. And now he finds himself in deadly peril. The weird, the unbelievable, the supernatural come alive before your very eyes in Equinox. The invisible barrier between good and evil between light and the forces of darkness. What is the secret of the thousand-year-old book? See four teenage boys and girls fight a devil cult for their lives, their sanity, their eternal souls in Equinox. In supernatural color. Equinox. Hey, Derek. Hi, Beth. This is Terry and Sir Tom from Michigan, and we're at Monster Dash. And we do miss you. It's just not the same without you and your cable and all the fun. We are hoping to see you in 2024. But in the meantime, have a great one. And know that I love you. Talk to you later. Bye. Oh, man, I love that. I love that so much. You know, whenever you go to a monster kid friendly event or a convention of any kind and you want to call in, please feel free to do so. 
Terry and Sir Tom, thank you for calling in. It sounds like you guys had a good time. I'm friends with y'all on Facebook, and I know y'all had a good time based on the post that you had there. I'm telling you, man, we, we want to go back. We want to go back. So thank you for calling in and you know sharing a little bit of Monster Bash love over the phone lines with us here at Monster Kid Radio. You know, if you want to call Monster Kid Radio and leave a voicemail about anything, really, you can call us at 360-524-2484. And that's exactly what Kevin Slick did when he got back from Monster Bash. Hey, Derek. Uh, I realize I'm a little bit late, but I'm taking you up on your uh, post on social media about calling about the Monster Bash. It's Kevin Slick here. Talking to you from Colorado now back uh, once again. A fabulous bash, but those of you that have been to the Monster Bash know that the best Monster Bash is either the one that you're in the middle of at the moment or the one that you're looking forward to coming up next because they're all they're all pretty great. There's there's just a lot of wonderful things. Um, Thursday, as usual, those of you that, that have been there know that Jeffrey Curtis uh, just pulls out random films from his uh, 16mm collection. Uh, this time it wasn't super random in that uh, one of the films that we were going to be showing was The Mummy's Tomb, and um, so he, uh, or The Mummy's Hand, rather, was one of the ones that was going to be shown in the regular bash schedule. So he showed all three of the Cheney Karish, Karis films, uh, as on Thursday uh, throughout the day, which was great. So let's see some other highlights. Friday. Friday was great. A lot of great stuff. Uh, Frank Delostrito, wonderful talk on the history of zombies in literature and movies, sort of the pre-Night of the Living Dead, post-Night of the Living Dead kind of thing. Uh, Zach Zito, once again, uh, wonderful with his presentation of The Monkey's Paw, a great, a great story that a lot of us know. Uh, Don Reese was back once again uh, doing his stand-up comedy, and that was it was wonderful to see Don. And uh, it had been a few years since he had been there, so I think there were some folks that had never had a chance to see him. Uh, Monster Game show, the What's My Monster? Always, always a fun, fun program to follow along and see if people can guess um, guess what the the monster is in that question. Uh, the New Invisible Man, 1958, was the Mexican monster movie night on Friday night with tacos and burritos handed out. Um, what else do we do? Saturday, of course, Saturday, get up and have cartoons and cereal. Excellent fun. Uh, we showed the Wagon Train episode, the Tobias Jones story with uh, Beverly Washburn with Lou Costello in his only dramatic role. And, uh, boy, it's a wonderful, wonderful episode. He was such a talented actor. It's a shame he didn't get a chance to do more. Uh, Beverly Washburn did a Q&A. Very fun. Uh, Stan Gordon, <clears throat> who's been there many times before, talks about UFOs, Bigfoot, that sort of thing. If you're into those kinds of things, he uh, he shared that and uh, seemed to do well. The... Brain Quiz with uh, Tom Weaver, the Brain Twister Quiz. Greg Mack did a talk on Of Mice and Men, which was wonderful. We showed, the, the, of course, the uh, classic 39 movie with, with Lon Chaney Jr. and Burgess Meredith in it. Great. Audrey Dalton, some of you might know from Boris Karloff ch uh, Thriller episodes, also The Monster that Challenged the World. She was there. Great. Daniel Roebuck, what a hoot. He is uh, a monster kid just like us, uh, loves the whole scene, and, uh, of course, talked about all the different wonderful films that he's been in. Uh, we showed the monster that challenged the world outside for the drive-in movie, and, of course, the uh, Festival of the New Wine song. Um, gave out the 40 awards. Uh, just a good time all in all. Um, some of the folks that weren't able to make it, uh, Charlotte Austin had been on the, the list but was not able to make it due to health Concerned. Same thing with Pamela Pierce from uh, Legend of Boggy Creek. But otherwise, a great time. Uh, Lynn Lugosi Sparks, wonderful, wonderful person sharing about her grandfather. And so, uh, good time had by all. Of course, the next Monster Bash coming up in October the 13th through 15th. Wow. I hope I see some of you there. All right. So long. Dude, that just sounds awesome. Oh, man. You know, what does the kids say? FOMO, fear of missing out. It's lessened a little bit 
by knowing that I can follow a lot of y'all on Facebook and y'all call in and that sort of thing. Yeah, and actually, uh, not this upcoming month, because this upcoming month is all kaiju stuff, I'm hoping. But in August, I have some audio that was recorded at the bash from Mike Ramsey. You know, he's one of Monster Kid Radio's intrepid reporters. You know, he goes there and he, he captures this audio from the various Q&As. Yeah, and I'm going to be going through that over the next month and then hopefully share that here on the show in the future as well. But until then, we do have Chris, who actually did an interview with one of the people there at the bash with Audrey Dalton. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, hey, why don't we get into that right now? Hi, this is Chris McMillan, uh, the writer and publisher of The Shadow Over Portland, acting as a reporter for Monster Kid Radio here at the Monster Bash in Pittsburgh. Uh, well, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm here talking with Audrey Dalton. Miss Dalton, how are you today? I'm very well. It's very nice to be talking to you. Thank you. How's the bash been for you so far? It's uh, day three right now. It's been wonderful, and the best part of it is, uh, for me is, is meeting people, and you're not just signing autographs and stuff, but chatting with people, and they have such interesting questions, and oftentimes you'll remember more about my work that I remember, and it's exciting and it's fun. I was in during your Q&A, and there's a question that I'd like to end on that someone asked you. I hope that's okay. But for right now, I know you, you're busy today. It's your last day here. So let's start with the TV show Thriller. There was at least one episode where you starred opposite Boris Karloff. What was it like working with Karloff? It was wonderful because... He was so easy to work with. He was soft-spoken, always prepared, a real pro. I mean, you know, he knew his lines. He knew he was a good actor. And the uh, dealing and talking with him off the set was wonderful. Uh, he was had lots of oh, conversations about work he'd done in the past and so on. And uh, just a real gentleman and a nice, a nice man. And indeed, you know, knew what he was doing when he was working. It was just a real pleasure with him. Thank you. Now let's jump a couple years ahead to The Monster That Challenged the World, which was shown here at the Monster Bash as their outdoor movie. Um, I don't know if you managed to get there, but it, oh, no. It was pretty crowded out on the lawn there, and a lot of people liked the movie. Just wanted to let you know that. Um, what's your memories working with that giant... Um, giant monster at the especially at the end because you're right in the middle of it well working with the monster was the low point of working with someone <laughs> you know the actors were marvelous that it was challenging you know a bit because of the, the technical difficulties at the time with getting the monster to emerge uh you know from where they had, had put him and uh, when that was settled but he really it really was gross uh, <laughs> this awful thing and uh, as I think I said uh, before he was slimy you know that was he had sort of emerged fr from water it was not and even though you, you know it's it was easy then to react it really was because you did not want, want that thing near you and then of course little uh, Melissa Gilbert who has played my daughter you know it really was sort of scared uh, she was you know five or six at the time I think so, yeah, it played itself pretty well. It was very nice to get my back to it and not have to look to it in the scene, you know. Now, you start with, um, in that movie with Tim Holt, and um, he had taken a break from acting for a little while. Um, I know he was mostly known for Westerns, but if I remember right, he also worked with um, Orson Welles early in his career, I think. What was it like working with him? I mean, he did a great job. You both did a great job in it. But what was it like working with um, Tim Holt? It was very easy. We hit it off right away. And, and you know, the chemistry was right uh, for the parts that we played. And he was so well cast in that. I mean, it was really Tim Holt as a person, the, you know, the way, except that's always the hardest thing to do is to play yourself. But, uh, no, it was. He was that way. He was a quiet, um, oof. Um, he just had the demeanor and spoke the words as he was himself. He was not very gregarious, but had a great sense of humor. And as I said, we hit it off, and um, it, it was easy, easy. It just, all the uh, words and the conversations came very easily. Script was well written uh, for the two characters we played. 
I wanted to mention that because you play a single mother whose husband died in um, as a test pilot, if I remember right. That's a surprising role back in the 50s. You didn't see too many single mothers, you know, widowed or not, in a movie. Uh, how did you feel about taking on that role? Because it, it is something a little groundbreaking for the time. It added a, another depth to the character, and the fact that uh, Holt, playing his character, understood my predicament and the difficulty of my life uh, in raising a child, and the awful sorrow and, and grief uh, with uh, what had happened to my husband. And it does make you think of all those spouses who have experienced that. It can't be easy. I mean, there are many jobs that are difficult, but that has to be really, really uh, something that affects you every day. Just one more question about the monster that challenged the world. Um, I'm sure a lot of people were surprised that you didn't have that famous photo of the woman in the white um, swimsuit draped over it. I was going to say, that wasn't you in that photo, was it? No, and I, when sometimes fans have sent me pictures to sign, and for a while I didn't, I would put a little note that it wasn't me. It was Barbara Darrow, uh, who's a, a lovely actor, and in the story, of course, she's drowned or, or vanishes by, by way of the monster, and that's her appearance in the film. And then that's very early at the, at the start. So, no, that's not me. Um, but it made for a wonderful poster. And uh, she looked gorgeous in it as she was. Indeed. Yeah, it does make for a wonderful poster. Um, let's go ahead a couple of years and talk about Mr. Sardonicus, uh, which was written and produced by William Castle. Sardonicus was fun right from the start. I mean, you read the script and... Uh, Will, Bill Castle was marvelous. Of course, you know, you interview for the part and so on. And he was so into this. Well, he's into all his projects, I've heard later. Uh, this is a, a big thing for him. And he attends to, to every detail, some within his job description, and others, he just pulled stuff out of the air uh, in the moment. So it was always a, a challenging uh, seen on on the set working with him and his attention to every detail uh, as I think I've, I've mentioned before uh, you know he was hovering over the hairdresser with what how she was doing hair on me and other people and giving suggestions which I'm sure got to be very irritating uh, and you know the, the makeup and the costumes he had a great say and the clothes and everything that people wore and he was very into setting the scene the mood of the uh, of you know the scenes with the with the monster, and I think uh, all of us, but particularly him, enjoyed all of those scenes that showed apparent you know torture and stuff, uh, because he had all these medieval torture instruments that were all you know, scattered around the set, and he insisted he tried every one you know he went on the rack and saw it and they were horrific. I mean, you I know things are terrible now. But my goodness, they did awful things to people then, you know, with the uh, the Iron Maiden, which was like a coffin standing upright, mm -hmm. uh, and the door opened, and it had a on the outside a human sort of shape, so it fit. The idea was you stepped into this, and they closed the door as you stood upright. However, inside, there were nails protruding mm -hmm. totally on, on one side of it, so uh, I can't imagine. I mean, but these instruments really were used uh, and he had researched that and he somehow found them uh you know i i presume there were probably in a museum somewhere should have pursued it at the time and asked about it but anyway yes it was fun i mean it shouldn't have been fun but it was yeah i was gonna say given the sadistic nature in some of those scenes how did you and the cast get over some of the nastiness in that movie well, first of all, we knew it wasn't real, which helps, which helps. It makes it very easy to do that. I think one of the worst things on that was the uh, the uh, a actor uh, who played one of the girls that came up to the uh, the castle or wherever he lived, uh, was where they put leeches on her to get her to comply. Uh, and there was, a, you know, a, a leech wrangler, you know, someone who actually, that was, he was had these leeches in a bucket 
And then when the moment was right, you know, she had to play, they put them on her skin. And I can't imagine that I could have played that. I don't know. It, it was so awful. And she did it without blinking an eye. It was wonderful. Uh, but of course, reacted as any normal person would react. But for the scene, she carried it off just, just beautifully. But oh, that was, wouldn't that be awful? Yeah, it really would. I know you have to get going. So I want to ask the one question that someone asked you in the Q&A last night. What was your favorite costume? Because I think the story behind it is fascinating. It was a dress that uh, I wore in Paramount's Casanova's Big Night a movie with Bob Hope. And it was uh, so decorative, lots of lace, and it was studded with pearls and other jewels. And they told me at the time that it weighed 50 pounds. I was very young then, and I was aware of the weight, but that somehow helped the dress, of course, just to hang properly. Uh, Pictures of it, I think, are available, or if you watch the movie, you'll, you'll see it. It was like an evening gown. And I was told later, not at the time, that that dress had belonged to one of the Tsarinas of Russia. And somehow or other, at an auction, I presume, uh, Western Costume got hold of it and had it in their uh, supplies. And later on, uh, Paramount obtained it and had it and used it in this uh, film. Uh, it was exquisite. I can't, I mean, really beautiful. And as I say, the weight at the time, um, it wasn't how you carried it, and it made you, I don't know, stand up straight. It, it made you regal. Uh, it was absolutely gorgeous, and you didn't drink coffee while you were wearing it either. <laughs> Must have been amazing wearing a costume with such history. Yes, yes. and I mean, they altered it and, and they, they, you always, with these any costumes in a film, you always wear the undergarments that the, would have been worn at the time. So, you know, it fits the way it should have fit uh, whoever wore it at the time. Thank you so much for taking some time out to talk with us. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the bash and a pleasant trip home. Thank you, and you're very good to take the time to talk. I love to talk about these things. I mean, it was really interesting, and I was very fortunate to have a career where I really had fun as well as doing my job. That is so cool. Oh, man. You know, I, I don't know how much fun it is for you listeners to hear me just talk about how cool this stuff is that people are sending into the show, but, man, it's so cool. So, again, Terry and Tom, or excuse me, Sir, Tom, <laughs> Kevin, and Chris, thank you for taking the time to call in or actually even just capture content at the bash. And of course, big thanks to Mike as well for the content you're going to hear in the future coming up down the line. Thank you for calling all that in. I, I appreciate it so much. Now, we have some other voicemails that uh, I want to get through. One of them is an older one that I have inadvertently been sitting on, not on purpose. It's just I lost access to my voicemail for a little while, but I got it back and I found this voicemail from Captain Billy. Hey, Derek. Hey, group. Captain Billy here. So, Derek, the black hole, what a great idea. Yes, you definitely need to watch this movie with Scott and Tracy. And please, if you're going to do it with Scott and Tracy, please bring the lovely Beth, the beautiful Beth, along for the ride. Have I don't know if she's seen it already. If she hasn't seen it, it's perfect. She can bring a whole new opinion to this movie Maybe bring in some viewpoints not the other three of you haven't seen. I'm assuming if she has never seen, she's not in love with it. Like you guys, I know you're in love with it. I'm assuming that Scott and Tracy are in love with it. So she can bring in, maybe she won't like it. Maybe she won't like all of it. Maybe she won't like parts of it. Maybe she'll hate the whole thing. Please. Sounds like a great uh, double date for you guys to do the black hole on the cast. I and Make it as long as possible. Make it two and a half, make it three hours. Talk about all you want. Make it nice long, make it two parts, whatever you want to do. Yes, I agree 100%. Uh, Scott and Tracy and Beth. That's a brilliant idea. Let me give you my personal history with the black, because I love the black hole. Let me give you my personal history. This movie came out, I believe it was Christmas time of 80. There were uh, toys aplenty. They were all suffering from the Star Wars bonanza. That didn't quite happen. Uh, there were model kits. There was a Cygnus and a Max Million and a... Um, Oh, well, not Cyrus. What's that little guy's name? Tyrone. What was it? <laughs> oh, Vincent. Vincent. There was a Vincent model kit. I had all three of those that all went off on eBay a long time ago and 
I made money on them. I made a lot of money, not not as much as I should have, but that's another story for another time. And I had the Amigo. I believe it was Amigo actually did the three three quarter figures for the movie. I had the Maximilian. I still have the Maximilian figure, and I even saved the backing board because I was that little nerd that saved all the backing boards. And I uh, oh, what the bed sheets? I had the bed sheets, and I had the pillowcase. I still have the bed sheet and the pillowcase. My kids slept on them, and I'm hoping someday one of my grandchildren will sleep on them. So here's the thing. I never saw the movie back in 1980. By 1980, I was uh, 13 years old when this movie came out, and I was, already, I was into movies, not just monster movies, not just science fiction movies, movies. I liked movies. And I had already discovered Siskel and Ebert on, uh, at the movies on PBS. And I knew who Jim Shallot was in the morning. Um, I don't think Leonard Moulton had appeared anywhere yet. But I knew people, Rex Reed used to review movies on television. So I knew, and I loved movies. I mean, I saw Rocky as a kid, and I saw, um, I saw big time adult type movies. Not, you know, not, I shouldn't have seen, but, you know, I saw stuff that wasn't monsters and, and spaceships. So I loved movies. So I used to watch at the movies religiously, and I watched all these review guys, and everybody reviewed the, the black hole, and then, the general census seems to be, it's boring. It's boring, and the ending is confusing. So my 13-year-old, I mean, look, my mother was willing to drive me to any movie I wanted, but still, I had to pick and choose. You don't go for everything. And there was, you ever heard of the movie Fade to Black? I got a whole story about that. I talked to my mother in the Take Me See, talking, talked to my mother in the Take Me See Fade to Black when I was 13 years old. Not a movie a 13-year-old should be seeing. That's another story for another time. So I had to pick and choose. So I saw the black hole and all the reviews, and Flash Gordon was coming out, and I wanted to see Flash Gordon. I believe that was also Christmas of 80. So I picked and choose. I was like, you know what? If black hole is boring, well, I'm not going to go with it. Flash, I really wanted to see Flash. I love Flash Gordon. So I never saw this. I even owned the, the soundtrack album. And I love the soundtrack album. Oh, my God. One of the best. Just, oh, that opening theme is like in my top five themes. Superman and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars. The Black Hole. That, oh, my God. I love that. And then, so I know recently they put the soundtrack out on CD. It's a full-blown soundtrack. I guess there's a whole story inside the liner notes about the history of the film getting made and the history of the soundtrack. And I guess the original elements were lost and they had to recreate. Or I, forget, I don't remember. I haven't read it since I saw it the first time, since I got it from the library a couple of years ago. But they do know, they talk about the history of the film. And one of the things in there said that that script for the Black Hole had been kicking around since the early 70s when the first big science fiction push came after 2001. Uh, Silent Running, Planet of the Apes, all that late 60s, early 70s, when that... So that black hole script had first come to Disney's attention. Now, I guess they had been sitting on top of it, and when Star Wars hit, boom, someone pulled black hole out, black hole out of the file cabinet. And I know they, uh, they went through several rewrites, from what I remember from the description of the lineups. Again, don't have it in front of me. I'm sure Scott and Tracy know way more about this than I'll ever know. But the whole soundtrack, like everything, parts that were uh, not used in the original film, is on that CD. I think it runs over 60 minutes, so it's more than was on the original album. And, oh, my gosh, is it just chef's kiss, magnificent. So, anyway. But, yeah, I never saw it in the theater. So, flash forward to 2019, 2020, 2021. I don't know, the last couple of years, Turner Cla- it finally shows up at Cla- Turner Classic Movies, nice high-def print. And I was like, oh, well, now's the time to watch this movie finally. And I loved it. It is – I think if I had seen this in 80, I might not have liked it. So, I'm kind of glad I waited because it is, although I am the kid, speaking of picking and choosing your movies when your mom, I was the kid who talked his mother into taking him in 1978 uh, to go see the 10th the anniversary re-release of 2001. And a little side note, my, the theater we had to go was a little bit of ways. And granted, look, it was a half hour, but my mother was, you know, a mother who drove in the 70s. And if she wasn't familiar with it, she didn't want to go. It wasn't that bad. It was basically one shot down one street and... You know, it was, like, it was 20 minutes down one street, turn right, turn left, drive down another 15 minutes, and the theater was right there. It wasn't that far away. But my mother talked my father into driving us. I saw two movies with my father back in the 70s. I saw 2001, and I saw Alien. And my father fell asleep within the first 10 minutes of both films. There are apes throwing bones on the screen, and my father is snoring the seat next to me. 
<laughs> and there is Harry Dean Stanton trying to find a cat in the middle of a spaceship, and there's my father snoring next to me. So I don't think he saw a frame of me. I think as soon as the lights went off, an alien he passed out. So that was the second time I saw Alien. Second time I saw Alien. So back to two, back to the black hole. Boy, I got I am sidetracked, Sally tonight. So the black hole. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I waited till I was you know in my fifties to see this movie. It is such a 1950s. It's a Captain Nemo movie. It's a guy with a big ship, and he's gonna. He's got this one mind determination. He's got to do this thing, and he knows it's the best thing to do. And oh, and it's so. And I know there's like this joint of stuff. Like they, you could feel that the there's that shootout scene with the laser guns. You can feel that was kind of tacked in that there wasn't enough action in this movie. Yeah, it is kind of dull. It's slow, but yeah, it feels just like some of those that came out. It's like it's like the sequel of Twenty Thousand Leagues. It's so I just I love it. I can't I don't know if I can recommend it to anybody. But God help me, I love it. I'm about to watch it right now, so I'm done dabbling. Derek, it's a great show as always. Keep up the good work. Thanks for everything. Bye. I've been wanting to talk about the black hole on Monster Kid Radio for a very, very long time. Now, I did see it in the theater. I have very distinct memory of seeing Black Hole or the Black Hole theatrically. And I had some of the posters or or, uh, promotional material as well. A couple of books, uh, you know, kids' books, coloring books, or something along those lines, I'm sure. Because I really, really liked the movie. And granted, Star Wars kind of blew it away in terms of uh, what movie kind of shaped my childhood and my obsession with film and movies and storytelling and science fiction. But uh, The Black Hole was certainly one that I remember fondly. And I've listened to the music quite a bit. And the music, the score, is so good. So, so good. So hopefully, maybe later this year, we can make something happen and get some black hole coverage happening here on the show. Fingers and tentacles crossed, as I like to say. Maybe we can make something happen with uh, Scott and Tracy over at Disney Indiana. You know, uh, our ships have been passing in various cyber nights lately, and I haven't really talked to them much lately about doing stuff on the show. I want to. uh, You know, we're still friends and all. It's just trying to make things happen scheduling wise has been a challenge of course they were running around at monster bash having a good time too so maybe that's what i need to do is i just need to ambush them at next year's monster bash and we'll make it happen i I don't know either way i definitely want it to happen now we had a follow-up voicemail from captain billy as well let's go ahead and play that here hey Derek. hey group captain billy here so you showed your wife manos you are a brave, brave man. You must have a love that runs deeper than the ocean. And you must have ultimate faith in this woman to subjugate her to Manos this early in your marriage. So congratulations. I'm glad she survived the experience. Um, by the way, speaking of Manos, uh, I was thinking about this. Since Manos was the first presented to the world on MST3K with the accompanying commentary, I feel that to watch this show or this movie in any other way, is to watch the um, special edition or the uh, CGI to death version of the movie, if, if you will. You know, something that was tampered with after its initial release and its first impression upon the public. So I think if you're watching without MST3K commentary, you are watching it the wrong way. But that's my opinion. So. Uh, also, I want to mention, um, oh, you want to say what Ray Harryhausen movie to expose her to first. Well, the obvious choice is your favorite. I mean, I think that's a slam dunk. I mean, personally, I think for, for the Sinbad movies, I think that's where Ray loved his dinosaurs, but it seems all of his creature creations were... Uh, and then, of course, there's always Jason and the Argonauts. Everybody loves that. But, I, yeah, I would lean towards one of those. But, again, ultimately, what's the one you love the most? Show her that. So I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I saw a movie. It was on Comet TV, and I checked. It's on Tubi. It's on, I think, Zumo. It's on a couple of the free streaming services. It's called Messiah of Evil, from 71. Um, this woman's father is an artist, and they don't, they apparently they live far away. They didn't say exactly where anybody, like, they believe the father was somewhere in California on the coast, but I don't quote me on that. It's been about a month since I watched it. So her, her father's letters are getting stranger and stranger as people are coming to get me, these creatures in the night, on and on and So eventually she drives out to find him and comes to his home, which is all, I mean, I want to know. I want to read a nice long magazine article about the making of this movie because I don't know where they shot this, but there's all this art on the walls 
and all you know all through the house and fascinating stuff. Uh, but anyway, so when she gets there, there is a, a gentleman and two of his female companions that are also looking for him because of his art influencing such a great artist. Maybe they don't really get into the real reason why they're there, you know. So it's and it just gets kind of creepier and creepier as it goes along. I find it really interesting. The only problem is the only print I could find, the only version of it, is apparently it's like it's off a of VHS tape. Uh, all three or four versions I saw were all appeared to be the same quality print. So I don't know if there's an HD print of this running around or not. It's real low budget, but yeah, it was some of the camera shots were amazing. They sh- they shot in some little town somewhere. So apparently they had the run, run of the town at night. There are these great night shots uh, from like crane shots or rooftop shots where you get whole streets illuminated uh, at night. And like I said, for what it was, I thought it was really good. I was very happy I watched this. It was sitting on my DVR forever, and I finally got around to watching it. Uh, but yeah, you can from Messiah of Evil from 1971. And like I said, it's available free on more than one service, probably on YouTube also. So, And the last thing I wanted to ask, oh, well, you, I, I was going to ask, um, you mentioned at the end of the last episode, or during the last episode, that Beth, you had watched some of Beth's movies. Because we're watching, Beth's watching some of your movies, you're watching some of Beth's movies. Well, you need to have Beth come on. You need to have a first viewing and have Beth come on. You guys need to do an episode like that to give your first viewpoint of a movie that she loves. So, you know, even, that, even that Jane Austen thing. I mean, again, you know, that 1968 rule, let's throw that out the window. Derek, let's, let's get real. So, Derek, great show as always. Keep up the good work. Thanks again. I am very happy to say that my marriage with Beth has continued to survive and thrive despite my mono sing her. In fact, there are some monos flavored things in the works here at Team Death, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I, I don't believe that there's any wrong way to enjoy a movie, as long as you're not impacting or impeding somebody else's enjoyment. At the same time, enjoy the movie however you want. If you like watching monos through the lens of Mystery Science Theater 3000, or some of these other riffing programs, knock yourself out. I enjoy watching it straight. It just, it does something for me. I dig it, man. I dig it. Although I can't say the same about Messiah of Evil because I've never seen it. It's a movie that I've been aware of for a while. You made a comment about how the various transfers that you've seen don't look that great. And this is one that turns up in a lot of public domain collections. So I I assume the movie's in the public domain, or a lot of people think it's in the public domain. I've not done the research myself to confirm that, which is a whole different thing. But anyway, Messiah of Evil does turn up in a lot of collections, and in order to make five or six or ten movies fit on a disc, usually the transfer is not very good. They don't take a lot of care with it. I don't know if there's a really good copy of it out there or not. Uh, It'd be something I'd be interested in seeing because I did just watch the trailer, and it looks good and creepy. It looks a little um, outside what I would do on things like the Monster Kid Movie Club Twitch stream, when I do eventually bring that back. It looks a little bit more graphic and gory than I would normally play, or at least bloody. And according to the website doesthedogdie.com, there are some things in it that might be a little too much for that channel. I've accidentally played things that have included imagery that I'm not comfortable with showing in the past on the Twitch stream, so I'm kind of hesitant to to just kind of show something without reviewing the movie first. But it does look good and creepy, and according to the website dvdcompare.net, there is a Code Red, or there was a Code Red Blu-ray of the movie release at one point. I assume that release looks a lot better or at least has been cleaned up a little bit. Code Red usually does a pretty good job about making these things uh, look better. Uh, Gloria Katz and Willard Hike, I think that's how you pronounce his name, but I'm not 100% sure, uh, were the producers on the film, and they have connections to, like, early George Lucas, which is kind of cool as well. So, yeah, I'd check it out at some point. And finally, you did mention my watching some of the movies that Beth really loves and enjoys. And while I haven't really watched a lot of movies that she has pitched to me, I have watched a lot of shows that she really enjoys, uh, TV shows, streaming programs, things like that. And so far, so good, man. I'm really enjoying it. Now, I don't know if talking about a Jane Austen movie 
is appropriate for Monster Kid Radio. But we have talked about other venues and other outlets for some of this stuff. As a lot of you know, we're trying to build up the Team Death YouTube channel. There is a link in the show notes, but just look up Team Death, and Death is spelled D-E-T-H, and you'll find us. We're the ones with the two coffins in the shape of a heart logo. We actually just did a three-part series exploring or discussing our fandom of the Indiana Jones films, getting ready to see Dial of Destiny later tonight, and we're going to review that on the YouTube channel as well. But we're looking to build up our content and come up with different things that we can do, and one thing that I thought about doing is watching some of the movies that she really loves and she actually pitched the idea of doing a movie watch along which is iffy depending on what the movie is we couldn't necessarily show the movie that we're watching but we could schedule a time to watch the movie live with people and do that sort of thing so that might be happening in the future as well stay tuned you know if you aren't on youtube following the team death youtube channel please consider throwing us a view a follow, a thumbs up, and a subscribe over there. It doesn't cost you anything. We're just trying to beef that channel up because we are trying to get multiple revenue streams going and just more content out there. And it makes it easier to generate more content when we know more people are enjoying that content. You know what I mean? Anyway, Captain Billy, thank you for calling in. I appreciate you doing so and just, you know, checking in with us and being patient with me as I go through the backlog of voicemails as well. We have one more voicemail I want to get to here. Let me pull that up right now. Hey, Derek, it's Tom Gerganis. Just got finished listening to the At The Earth Core episode with Mark Holmes. That was a fantastic episode. Mark is a really, really knowledgeable guest, and I enjoyed the heck out of this show. Uh, At The Earth Core is a fun, fun, fun movie, and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs is in my top three favorite author so it was really good hearing the um biographical information about him uh, in the future i would love to hear mark talk about warlords of atlantis which is kind of a grail movie for me i've never seen it i always wanted to uh so yeah that would be my vote having him back soon uh really glad everything's going well for you uh Hope to talk to you soon. Tom Greganus. See you later. Tom, thank you so much. I appreciate you calling in. And I know uh, I actually owe you an email or two. You've been reaching out to me about some non-Monster Kid Radio stuff, sort of. We should probably talk in the near, near future. I've just been so busy trying to get things done. Tom Greganus is the man from Go Forth and Game. You can find him at GoForthAndGame.com. And... Mark listens to the show, so I'm sure he heard your uh, positive thoughts about his appearance on the show, uh, about At The Earth's Core, and yeah, I definitely want to have Mark on in the future as well. Again, July is our kaiju month, but maybe down the line we can do some more Edgar Rice Burroughs films. Warlords of Atlantis actually has my interest quite a bit as well, so I'm going to be reaching out to Mark probably within about a month and a half or so to start scheduling a return for him and a return to the worlds of Edgar Rice Burroughs. So thanks again for calling in, and thanks to everybody who called in. I appreciate all of you. You can email me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com, or you can call and leave a voicemail like these fine folks did at 360-524-2484. As I've said in the past, the Google voicemail line has got a three-minute limit, but you can be cool like Captain Billy and call, and if you get cut off, call back, and then I stitch it all together and post Makes it sound like one long voicemail and you're good to go. So feel free to call in if you have more than three minutes worth of stuff to say. That's no problem. And actually, now that I'm talking about Captain Billy again, it occurs to me that I did not address something that he brought up. We've been talking about showing Beth some Ray Harryhausen films. Harryhausen's birthday was actually earlier this week. Didn't really have time to sit down with some Harryhausen films because Beth and I have been doing an Indiana Jones marathon. But Captain Billy said that the best movie for me to show her would be my favorite Ray Harryhausen film. And that one's tough because I really do like them all. The one that I really, really like that I find myself going back to actually doesn't have a lot of creatures in it. Um, Doesn't have any. It just has flying saucers. I love Earth versus the flying saucers. I really do. That one's a, a, a personal favorite of mine. But it doesn't have the stuff that Harryhausen is most known for, the creatures, the monsters. Uh, Well, I guess he called them creatures. 
You know, I do like the Valley of Guanji. Maybe I can show her that one. That one's got an interesting female lead, too, so she might respond well to that. The Sinbad movies are great, and I know we had some other recommendations as well. So, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, eventually, I will ask her to sit down to watch the Ray Harryhausen movie with me, but maybe I ought to watch some more Jane Austen adaptations with her first. I do kind of owe her. You know, she's been kind of playing in my fandom a lot when it comes to films. I'd like to get into her fandom a little bit more. That's not a euphemism. Anyway, let's go ahead and wrap up the show. I appreciate everybody being here. You know, you can learn everything you need to know about Monster Kid Radio over at monsterkidradio.net, where you're going to find links to everything that we've talked about here on the show, links to Mark's stuff going on, our Amazon affiliate link as well. So if you're going to buy anything on Amazon, please use the Amazon affiliate link because it helps me out in the long run. It definitely helps out the podcast and helps us keep going. We have links to our Facebook page our Facebook group, our Twitter page, our Discord, our Patreon, and our Reddit. It's all there, man. And the Patreon thing, I want to bring that up because the Monster Movie Quiz Trivia Showdown Throwdown Hoedown thing that we did was a Patreon-exclusive thing for people who are patrons of $5 a month or higher. And we're going to be doing it again. Now, in August, we're probably going to play a version or a cleaned-up version of the audio from that trivia game. So you're going to get a little bit of trivia here on the show, but I'm going to do some more of that as well. I'm looking at sometime in July, probably towards the end of the month, probably again on a Sunday, this time around, probably about 1 or 2 p.m. Pacific. So just keep that in mind while you're making your decisions to remain a patron of Monster Kid Radio if you are over on Patreon or to become a patron over on Patreon.com. And we'll get you set up to where you can play along with the next round of Monster Movie Trivia. 35 questions, some of them really easy, some of them ridiculously hard, and it's all a lot of fun. So stay tuned for an announcement coming up about that. And I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and wrap up the show and get this out. Like I said, Beth and I are doing our Indiana Jones thing over on Team Death. And later tonight, we're going to go see Dial of Destiny. If you're interested in hearing our thoughts on that, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Team Death over there, and you'll be able to catch up with the Joneses with us. Until next week, remember, Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution on commercial no derivatives 3.0 unported license. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Black Blades in the Shallows. That is copyright 2022, The Rum Tones. You can find it on their self-titled album, The Rum Tones, over at The Rum Tones bandcamp.com. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes. Go check them out. Let them know the Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week. Ciao. Ciao.